Welcome back everybody to the teachings on the book of Revelations. Today we are going to Revelations 1 verse 8. So gather your notebooks and your Bible and your pen and I'm going through the Amplified Bible. Revelations 1 verse 8 says the following, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. He who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty the ruler of all. Okay, so let us first have a look at these two words, Alpha and Omega. Alpha means beginning or first, denoting God as the beginning of everything. Whereas Omega means great or the last, the end, denoting God as the end of everything. The Bible does not say that there is anything that will come after him. The prophet Isaiah wrote that God say, is saying there is nothing or nobody after him. Look at Isaiah 44 verse 6 to 8. From this we can assume that he will reign into eternity, meaning non-stop. So here are a few interesting facts. Firstly, he is the Alpha and the Omega. The word Alpha comes from ancient Greek and is pronounced Alpha and is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. In the system of Greek numerals, it has a value of 1. Originally from the Phoenician and Hebrew letter Aleph, meaning an ox or a leader. I found this interesting that the word, which means beginning, also means ox. The ox might have something to do with the vision that Ezekiel had in Ezekiel 1 verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they each had the face of a man in front and each had the face of a lion on the right side and the face of an ox on the left side. Listen to that. And the four also had the face of an eagle at the back of their heads. Interesting. So refer Revelations 4 verse 7. I do very well understand why the word beginning can also mean leader since God, the bodily Godhead, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit was there from the beginning in creation and he is certainly the ultimate leader of nations, tribes, languages and peoples. The word Omega is the 24th letter of the Greek alphabet, also the last letter. In the Greek numeric system, Gematria, the value is 800. Omega often denotes the end of something or the last of it. Isn't it strange that a name that means end has a number value that means new beginning? <laughs> this really makes sense to me. He is the beginning one and the end, 800, which is really a new beginning when the bride will reign and rule with Christ here on the earth when he returns. So now let us look at this section in the scripture, He Who Is. Let us break these open in three different sayings from Christ. He is refers to Him being part of our everyday lives, even now here on earth. He is with you and will never leave nor forsake you. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Look at the scriptures on the screen. And so are you. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, You are together with Christ in heavenly places in the Spirit. He says, I am. This denotes that He is the firstborn from the dead who is with us now. Christ makes your life worthwhile as you serve God continually till the end. See Romans 8 verse 17. We are joint heirs with Christ. Even now we can ask for things we need and desire because we are linked up with Christ in the heavenly places. Right, the second part of that scripture is He who was. So from the beginning of creation, Jesus was there. Look at Genesis 1, 26 and 28. He assisted in creation and he continued through the ages to appear to people even in the Old Testament. For 2,000 years or more, he was with us 
and was the one who sacrificed himself on the cross for us so that we could have a life in victory even in this wicked world. He died. Listen, this is past tense. He died already. And this gave you reconciliation with God the Father through the veil that was torn. He was the risen Lord who ascended into heaven. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son was given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, and Prince of Peace. Luke 2 verse 12. Now the third section of that scripture is He who is to come. Jesus is the one who is coming. Through ages and ages, Christians all over the world have been waiting for the return or the reappearance of Jesus Christ our Lord, the Messiah. This is the part of our doctrine of faith, believing that He will come back as He has promised. This is the hope that we have for our future, that He will come with the clouds and we will look upon Him who is to come. Even if we as children of God should die physically while we live here on earth, we will see the glory of our Lord when He comes. Isaiah 40 verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord God will come with might and His arm will rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him and His recompense before Him. Revelation 22 verse 12 says, Behold, I am coming soon. And I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and render to each one just what his own actions and his own work merit. See also Revelation 22 verse 7. And behold, I am coming speedily. Blessed, happy to be envied is he who observes and lays to heart and keeps the truth of the prophecy, the predictions, consolations and warnings contained in this little book. You are highly favored because he is your high priest. You are forgiven because he was the one who died for you on the cross. And you are not forsaken by God because Jesus is the one who will come and you will see him with your own eyes. This is his promise in his word. So Jesus is also the mighty ruler of all. Another part of the scripture says, The Almighty God name came from the Old Testament in Genesis 17 verse 1 and other scriptures. Look at your screen. Came from the Hebrew name El Shaddai, which means God the All-Powerful One. Exodus 6 verse 2 and 3 says, And God said to Moses, I am the Lord. So he was El Shaddai. Verse 3. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But my name, the Lord, Yahweh, the redemption name of God. I did not make myself known to them in acts of great miracles. God is the Almighty. We have to realize that. Not just because He said it, but also because the Word of God reminds us over and over through things He has done. How mighty He is really is. The first thing we learn from the Bible is that God in all this almightiness loves us deeply. This gives us something to hold on to when other things of the world try to drag us down. But in 1 John there is a few scriptures that teach us of the fundamentals of being a Christian. Firstly, God is love. Secondly, if you do not love God, you are not acquainted with Him. And thirdly, God loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. Imagine that. That is John 3.16. Now let us look at another scripture. 1 John 4 verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is and springs from God. And he who loves his fellow man is begotten or born of God and is coming progressively to know and to understand God. How beautiful is that? 
to perceive and to recognize and get a better and clearer knowledge of who this God is. Verse 8, he who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. 1 John 4 verse 9 says, In this the love of God was made manifest or displayed, where we are concerned in that God sent His Son, the only begotten or unique Son, into the world so that we might live through Him. Verse 10, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God loved us so very much, we also ought to love one another. Well, that's easier said than done in this world we are living in today, right? So God loves everybody, not just believers. He loves the unbelievers too. Though he hates the sin that they do because he knows how it can damage them. But God loves. He loves you while you sing in the shower. He loves you while you drive your car. He loves you while you are intimate with your spouse. He loves you while you are working in the garden. He loves you when you are responsible enough to pay your bills at the end of the month. He loves you when you rebuke your child. He loves you when you walk your dog. He loves you when you make toast, eggs, and bacon for breakfast. Get it, people? He loves you. Nothing you can do can separate you from the love of Christ. He loves you even when you fall off the wagon now and then and do things that you are not supposed to do. When you sin, it will not remove His love for you. Instead, he wants you to have a good thoughts from above about living an upbeat life, having blessings, being healthy, living in providence, having a good lifestyle. This is His hope for you. God provides us with everything we need and desire to be able to live a good and happy life here on earth while we are waiting in anticipation for the reappearance of His Son, our Lord and Savior. Look at Zephaniah 3 verse 17. God is so almighty that He can do anything. He created the heavens and the earth by speaking a word and sent it forth throughout the universe. Every word he spoke is still floating through spaces unknown to us. For the Bible declares, his word does not return null and void. The word he sends out must find a place to create what he spoke. How amazing is this God that we serve. All creation worship and adore him. They sing hymns and psalms towards Him in adoration. He is the creator of everything we see. The grass, the rivers, mountains, trees, the birds, animals, the sea creatures and the humans. He did it all. He put a pile of ground and mud or soil together and formed a man's image according to his own. Then he breathed his breath of life into the ground and it became a living soul. The first man, Adam. He raised people from the dead in his almighty power. There is no sinner so bad that he will not save you if only you would submit to him and receive his love. There is no sin so bad that he will not forgive you, except if you grieve the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 4.13. Through his almighty acts, he has given us a Holy Spirit with immense power that lives inside of us. How blessed are we? God is a righteous God. The psalmist wrote about his righteousness in Psalm 119 verse 137. Every action God takes, every decision He makes, every word He speaks, every promise He fulfills, He is righteous. Never is He unfair or never can He lie, for He is not a man. 
He does not have favorites among his children and he treats everyone in the same way. Look at Romans 2. Even though some people do not believe this as others have more than they. In his righteousness he saved many people like Hagar and her son in the desert. He saved David from Saul. Daniel was saved from the lions in the den. Moses and the whole nation was saved to go through the Red Sea when the Egyptians were right behind them. Daniel's friends were saved from the burning furnace. The Almighty is a righteous God. He was even ready to save that horrible city, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18, if Abram could find ten righteous people in it. But he couldn't. When Jesus reappears, God will sit on his great white throne judging all souls and he will be just and fair. What you sowed in life will be reaped in that moment of truth when you stand before the almighty righteous judge. Look at Revelation 15 verse 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Mighty and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Omnipotent. Righteous, just, and true are your ways, O Sovereign of the ages, King of all nations. The fact that he is righteous does not mean that he will not reveal his wrath from heaven against ungodliness. Look at Romans 1.18. His wrath is not for the children of God, but against unbelievers. However, he will never be unjust or smite without reason. Galatians 6, 7 teach us that. Do not be deceived and deluded and misled. God will not allow himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions or professions, or by his precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God. For whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. So be careful then how you live your life. Look also at Ephesians 5 verse 6. God is a forgiven God. His forgiveness is explained in his righteousness. 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, I write you these things so that you may not violate God's law and sin. But if anyone should sin, we have an advocate, one who will intercede for us with the Father. It is Jesus Christ, the all-righteous, upright, just, he who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. How marvelous that we can be forgiven and can be called my little children by the Almighty God. Throughout the Bible, we see places where God has forgiven us and others. Jesus forgave Peter when he denied him three times. Luke 22 verse 54 to 62. Sometimes I am so amazed at how quickly God forgives us our trespasses, even though sin is an offense towards God. God is immensely patient while he waits for you to get into the plan and purpose that he has for your life. Romans 15 verse 5. Now may the God who gives the power of patient endurance, steadfastness, and who supplies encouragement, grant you to live in such mutual harmony and such full sympathy with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. That together you may unanimously, with united hearts and one voice, praise and glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, Christ the Messiah. He is patient in waiting for us, Psalm 145 verse 8. In everything he instructs us to do, he sends us an invitation every day to speak to him, to study his word and to have deep, meaningful conversations with him in an intimate place. Yet we sometimes miss it too completely that we do not even realize what we are missing out on. That intimacy with God. How can you not have that? He has a spirit of long suffering and even though we do not deserve his freely given grace, 
He waits patiently for us to receive His Son's sacrifice on the cross. He promises that the work He started in us will be fulfilled till the end. Philippians 1.6 He is pure, holy, kind, a good teacher and almighty God. Look at Exodus 3.13 again. I am who I am. A finality. He is absolute, perfect, humble, and He is full of grace. God is trustworthy, so faithful, and merciful. Genesis 43 verse 14, and the Almighty One. He is enduring, full of peace. He has everlasting joy and is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, full of hope for us, His children. God the Almighty is eternal and cannot change. Who can ever be like God? Who can understand the way He thinks or the things that He does and why? The way in which He moves through the eternities and ages. The way He creates new beings even in today's life. There are still animals and plants that are created new that scientists find every day. Every new baby that is born is a miracle work from God. He creates new fleshly beings, little kittens, lovely colored birds, sea creatures that have not even yet been discovered, all kinds of animals, fishes, birds and things. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, His love towards us never changes. It stays the same throughout. The Almighty God is a powerful God. See how Ezekiel speaks about the power of God in Ezekiel 10 verse 5. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even to the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when He speaks. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty, says Psalm 29 verse 4. There is no God in heaven, on earth or under the earth that can compare to the Almighty our God. He conquered many nations on behalf of His children in the Old Testament. And even today He will fight the fight on your behalf if you will ask Him. He is a great, mighty, fearful and awesome God and is to be revered. You can read more scriptures together with Revelations 1 verse 8 with regards to God being the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty God. Look at all the other scriptures on the screen. But that's all I have for you this week on the book of Revelations. We will continue shortly. I trust that you'll be blessed. I pray for you. May God bless you this week to come. Shalom.